Hi, this is Nancy Herald, and welcome to my show, High Road to Humanity. In every episode, I tell you powerful true stories filled with great wisdom that you can use in your own life as you strive for a higher road to travel. My featured guests will have their own unique stories to tell that enlighten your mind and your soul. So kick back, relax, and learn the secret to success when you take the high road. Hi, this is Nancy Yearell, and welcome to High Road to Humanity. And I have Dr. Donna Marks here today, and welcome to High Road to Humanity, Donna. Thank you so much for having me on your show, Nancy. I'm excited you're here. You guys, she's written this cool book. It's The Healing Moment. This is what it looks like. This is a good one. I really enjoyed reading this. This is something that people need right now. And this is, it's just really needed as we get into it today. Um, you know, actually sit back and relax. Let me, I'll tell you a little bit about it before we get into it. So are you ready to emerge from your cocoon, but struggle with pseudo comforts like food, drugs, technology, and relationships that are no longer working? Wow. Does that sound like everybody, right? Are you ready to listen to the voice of love rather than the voice of fear? So if you said yes, then this is when the healing moment occurs. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm so excited that you're here. Listen, you guys, I want to bring up a couple things. Uh, North Carolina, here's the headline. A man in custody in connection with shooting of a six-year-old. And this is terrible. Um, he was taken into custody. Excuse me. And uh, this is really, really weird. You know, life has gotten really crazy. This is because a basketball rolled into his yard. And this has really gotten crazy. And this happened, well, he was arrested in Florida. You're down in Florida, aren't you? Right yes. Now? Yeah. Well, this I happened in North Carolina, but he fled. And I just want, the reason I'm bringing this up is that this is why this book is needed. I mean, our world is getting crazier and crazier and crazier by the minute. And so I, I bring this to people's attention because this is nuts. I mean, how could you shoot somebody because they rolled a basketball into your yard? I also saw in the news, I'll just bring this up, not that I want to bring bad news into the world, but there was a, a gentleman who was afraid he was in his 80s. I can't remember what state this was in. You might have seen this, Donna. And it was a, a young kid at the door. He went to the wrong address. And the guy freaked out and he shot him. But see, I think people are afraid. There's so much fear, you know? And, and that's why I bring this up because this is not normal behavior that we're seeing going on right now. Now, because this is High Road, I had to give a happy story today, you guys. So let check this out. This is great. Here's the headline. She's happily married with six all because of a text sent to the wrong number. So when a woman texted an uplifting Bible verse to the wrong number, she couldn't have imagined what this small mishap would lead to. So it was 2009, Brenda Rivera hoped merely to cheer up a friend with the Lord's counsel of do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But instead, she cheered up a total stranger named Isaiah Stearns. Well, I won't get into the whole thing, but he got the text and they got together. They have now been married and they have six kids. You guys check this out. <laughs> All because she texted the number to the, you know, to the wrong number. I just think that's amazing. See how God works. I think that's cool. Anyway, so let's get into the healing moment. Um, Donna, you know, you say in the beginning of this, we're all born with an inner light. Um, but instead of, um, you know, shining that light with love, sometimes it gets doused. Talk about this. Well, I, I do believe that we're all born with that inner light. Uh, if you look at a newborn baby, it, it's the most beautiful, purest light being imaginable. They're, they're so precious. We have a new addition to our own family. So it's really fresh on my heart and mind. Oh, wow. Um, how radiant and how receptive 
and how uh, just just a pure little bundle of love. And um, it, it's so exciting. And what happens though, uh, when, and, and I just want to preface, you know, one time I did a workshop and, um, I was talking about what happens early in childhood. And there was a, there was a whole table full of women, uh, that were, um, probably, uh, age and they really were offended. They, they didn't, I didn't deliver the message in a, in a way that was receptive. They heard blame. And I just want to oh. start off by saying, we're, we're not blaming anybody. This isn't about blaming, um, I, you know, I made so many mistakes as a parent. So yeah. we don't know then what we know now. And also we tend to raise our children the way we were raised. That's our handbook. You know, when you go to the doctor and I, I hope to change this someday, but when you go to the doctor, there's not a, there's not a handbook on said, here's how to create a child who will feel loved. <laughs> you know, there's all kinds of parenting books, but if the child doesn't feel loved, that inner self-love does get doused. Yeah. Um, get doused by um, ma being made to feel unworthy, being neglected, being physically, sexually, emotionally mistreated um, or abused uh, or ignored. I mean, there's so many things as unhealed trauma, you know, your favorite grandparent died and you weren't allowed to really cry about it or, you know, you, you just didn't understand it. And so these, these cause wounds and those wounds hide that inner light. Right. I want to interject here because I'm a child of the 60s and my mom, God bless her, she read those books that said, let your kids self-soothe. <laughs> oh, my God. There's like, and, and as you're talking, I'm thinking there's a whole generation of us out there who were left to self-soothe which is the worst thing you could ever do for a child. And I just, you know, do taught, you? Yeah, if you're yeah. not taught how to be soothed, first you have to be soothed before you can self-soothe. Right, exactly. So have you, I mean, I'm, I'm bringing this up because I am of that generation. And I want to know, have you seen a lot of people, maybe that's with the ladies at the table. I mean, have you seen a lot of that where it was a generational thing where that's what was taught? Right, that it, it was, and and um, th there's a lot of other things too. I mean, okay. parenting it's not always easy, and if you don't know how to do it, um, and and if you don't know how to create a, a um, your, the participant with a child, you know, to form where that child feels very secure, feels warm, feels cuddled, feels supported, feels guided feels valued and and the the parent knows when to hold and when to allow self-soothing when mm -hmm. to uh direct and when to allow independence you know th there's a lot involved in in mental health development and right. you think w w our generation had problems you, you should see what's happening <laughs> now you know there's it's just total chaos so um, it's not any better. It's if anything, it's even it's worse. worse. It's there worse. was more home stability back then. Now it's there's very little, uh, in a lot of homes, not all homes. There's just as many parents now that are really working hard at understanding how to have healthy children, and they're doing their part. So I don't want to leave them out of the equation. And yeah, I, you know, I don't know. Or, yeah, no, you're right. There probably is worse. I, I don't know. I I was a single mom for many years not the whole time, but for many years. And mm -hmm. there were a couple things that I did that I think helped. I mean, my kids grew up to be, I don't know, <laughs> pretty decent adult, I have to say. They're productive adults. But one thing I did was I always had everybody eat dinner together. You know, little things like that. Um, because that was like the only time, you know, I was working, they were in school. I mean, that was the only time the communication and what I see, and you're the expert on this, not me, but I just tell you my own experiences. But what I see in the world is that there isn't that family time that used to be years ago. You know what I mean? The family structure is a lot different than it used to be. Meals at the table was a very common tradition uh, not just meals at the table, food preparation, and cleaning up the table afterwards. It was all part of a gathering and a participation. And now there's so much fast food and both parents working or single parents very tired, a um, lot of to-go food and things like that. So it, it's not quite the same <clears throat> that it used to be. That That's very true. 
Mm -hmm. um, but we can still put forth those same efforts. It doesn't have yeah. to, it doesn't have to go away. And single parenting, I'm, I just want to mention this because yeah. uh, when you have, especially when, either way, you know, if you have a mom who's single raising children, you cannot be the father and the mother. The When the mother turns into the father, it, it feels like a monster because the mother is supposed to be nurturing and soft and guiding and the warm and fuzzy one. And then the father represents, you know, I'm a psychoanalyst, so. Yeah, I know. No, I'm glad you're saying this. <laughs> but the father represents that harshness of life. You know, if you walk out in the front, front of a car, you might get hit. If you steal, you might really get into trouble. If you break the law, you will go to jail. This kind of thing. It represents that. And that is the healthy, you know, that is healthy conditioning where there's the world as a, the universe, you know, if you go out in a hurricane, you might get killed, you know, the, the, yeah. the laws of reality take place in the early childhood development. And so there is that blend and that nurturing. And, and so the child, you know, who is allowed to experience both sides, a single parent cannot be both. I talked to a, a gentleman yesterday. He is a physician. His wife died and left two young children behind. And he had to be Mr. Dad and Mrs. Mom. Right. And it was very difficult, very right. difficult. And well, so, you know, it's just, we, we, it's very, you know, it, I think it really needs to be acknowledged that I see a lot of moms and dads feel very guilty for all the mistakes they made, but you cannot do both roles is what I'm trying to say. You just, I'm really glad you just you're saying do. this. Yeah. You're probably the only person that's ever said this to me, <laughs> but it's true. Oh, um, oh, so many, so many yeah. um, parents need to hear this. Well, you know, thank like, you. Oh, you know, thank I, I should have done this, should have done that. Da, da. I'm like, you couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't. Right. Yeah. And you know, I don't mean to, I can only go by my what happened to me personally but you're absolutely right because I had to, I had two teenage girls you know they were like four years apart I'm not going to tell you how old they are now because then I'll age myself but I had two teenage <laughs> girls and it was hard I mean and you're right I had to be well I felt I don't know I'm going to ask you what advice you would give me today if I was back into that position but I had to be the strong arm because I had to scare them a little bit because I had to make them a little bit of, afraid of me or they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't mind or they wouldn't do what was proper. And right. it it's was not your job hard. To be their best friend. It's not your job. As a no, no. Friend. And you I have to yeah. be the authority figure as well. Yeah, yeah. it was really, I'm going to tell you, it was very difficult to be both. And it's taken, I'll just say this and I want to know your feeling on it. It's taken me years to like my youngest daughter, we battled because she, you know, drank and drove and I had to take the car away and I had to be the bad guy. And it's taken years for us to get back because of those things I had to do. So address that. What would you tell me today? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's It was hard. Yeah. Well, I don't know that I, I could tell you anything different, you know, to allow uh, your child to have logical consequences to bad decisions. Mm -hmm. Drinking and driving is a very bad decision. It's bad for her. It's bad for the car. But most importantly, it would be very bad if she hurt someone else. Right. And so, that's um, right. Those natural consequences. I, I but I, you know, I don't know how, you know, I'm just bringing know. it up because yeah, that's, the, that's it's reality. Very healthy. You know, one of the problems nowadays is that two things, people don't want consequences, resent having them. And, you know, you're wrong to give them to me. <laughs> and then the other problem is that, you know, there's a sense of entitlement, you know, I, I deserve know. to get away with whatever I want and to receive whatever I want. And, um, you know, you can, you can force that on a lot of people, but you can't force it on everybody. And mother nature certainly isn't going to comply to those wishes. Right. So, right. Now that's something interesting that you're bringing up because it sounds like you raised your children that, that they would have to be responsible for their actions. Absolutely. Very Absolutely. Well, I have, I was raised with values and morals and respect. And those are the things that we've lost that I'm hoping we can come that will come back. Our society has lost respect for human life. And you yeah. were just speaking about something that's you know I've I've talked about for a long time and I'm glad you brought it up it's the entitlement mindset I mean we've it's flipped it's gone from people being grateful to well you owe me 
How dare you not give me what I want on demand? Yeah, correct. And it's ruined our it's ruining our society, right? Because I'm watching. There's that's why there's nobody to go to work. Because the right. the 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 values, you know, my dad instilled in me, you know, the work ethic. Probably too much. I'm over the top in the work ethic. But a lot of us were really, you know, those values were instilled when we were young and they carried with us. And that's not right. carried, that's not well, done. It, anymore. it goes beyond it goes beyond value. And you know, I address all, all this in my book, The Healing Moment. It goes beyond value. It it's it has to do with self-love. You know, every human being has a purpose. We all have we didn't just come here to hang out and be taken care of. That's not why we're here. We, we came here to love and to laugh and to play, but also we have a purpose. Mm -hmm. And if we're not tapping into that purpose and manifesting that and making a difference, either in our family, you know, your purpose might be to be the best dad on the planet. I don't right. know. Yeah. But you have one. It could be art. It could be music. It could be teaching. It could be nursing. It could be doctors. It could be, you know, uh, you really like cleanliness. So you could, you know, you're in the sanitation. It, it you maybe you like order and you work for the post office. I don't know. I mean, it's all a value. It's all of immense and wonderful and great value. And we have a purpose of sharing and receiving love. So when we sit back and don't acknowledge those gifts that we have within each one of us mm -hmm. and share that with other people we are depriving ourselves of a happy and joyous life that's the biggest problem so one of the things i'm trying to do in, in, in the book here is to really help people to understand that like yeah it might seem easier to um be at the mercy and and say oh great i'm getting money from whatever and i don't have to i don't have to worry about taking care of myself but talk about dousing light you're dousing mm -hmm. your own light when you do that and mm -hmm. so it's impossible to just receive and receive and feel the joy that comes from giving back yeah you um, make a lot of sense in this book i learned myself but a lot of people don't know this there is that inner child and i used to make fun of it <laughs> And now I realize that we all have this inner child. And here's what I see. And I love how you talk about this in the book. A lot of people just don't want to face the pain that happened. A lot of, they want to blame or they don't want to face the pain, but you say, take back your power, which I agree with so wholeheartedly because we all have the choice. We can either be victims or we can take back our power. We can go within. Absolutely. Yeah, we go within and work on ourselves because each one well, of people, us, people that don't want to face their pain, we're taught it's not okay to cry. It's right. not okay to be angry. It's not okay to be upset. And so they've learned how to just tuck it away and bottle it up and put a lock and key on it. And then when you tell them or when, like when they're here in my office, you know, uh, I say, you know, it's okay to feel those feelings. And it's like, oh, I'm, I don't know. I don't I'm scary. <laughs> Why? Because if I start, I might never stop. Or, you know, I was made fun of, or um, I was told I was weak, you know, so many different kind of messages that we have to say, take the eraser and erase all that and just be human. And when we let go of that pain, we release it. And we're not carrying around all those bags of dirt anymore. I know. We're free. I know. Well, I always say we're reprogramming. We're erasing those bad thoughts. And this is something I've been working on. I talk to the audience about it all the time. You know, you get that bad thought in, you got to switch it to a positive thought. And it takes a while because those negative thoughts were programmed into us when we were kids. And then we're like, like, I can remember, <laughs> I bet you've heard this a lot. I can remember going into a store and saying something like something came out of my mouth and I'm like, that was not me. That was my mother. And I, do you hear that a lot because of the programming that we've gone through I mean it's just normal but you know yes yeah, a lot of people um and it may not be it may not even be parents it could be anybody that mm -hmm. did some kind of and you know some type of interjection into your unconscious but you know it's just as easy that people would interject positive things too and that's one of the one of the messages of my of all my books is that uh you know we can really 
put that bullet in someone's brain in a positive way, you know, like, look at how gifted you are. Look at how well you write. Look at how good you are at science. Look at how good you draw. Mm -hmm. Look at how good you listen to people. Look at what a great little team leader you are at age seven. Look at how yeah. great you swing that bat. We can, you know, or look at how kind you are. You tell a child how loving and kind they are. They believe it and they are loving and kind. You'd call them a brat or this or that. They believe that. That's who so they become. Yeah. We have, as adults, when we didn't get those right messages, we have to reaffirm ourselves we have to say what are my gifts what is my purpose and not let anybody you know i if i let someone take that away then i'm being i'm doing it to myself i'm getting yeah. the victim. you're giving away your power it, it reminds me of the the movie the help where she tells the little girl you're smart and you're important and i i recognize that so much in that movie because that little girl needed to hear it and she had to hear it from somebody and that was really, I don't, that's true. You know, there's something that really hit it's me. scary too, by the way. Most people, when they start to, to be told these kinds of things we're talking about, they get very scared. Why? It, it, well, it, it's, it's the same thing when, when with, with religious indoctrination, you know, if I'm responsible, like, are you telling me I can be successful? Are you telling me I have a talent? Are you telling me I don't need to depend on other things for that anymore? And, you know, I'm not saying that because there is an interdependency. We all sharing, it's about sharing and receiving. But yes, I am telling you that you don't have to be dependent on anyone or anything other than your God-given talents. Mm -hmm. And that can be scary. Oh, <laughs> some people don't know how to do that. So they have to learn. They have to learn how to take care of themselves as an adult, as a successful adult. And so it's just a matter of, you know, developing a plan and learning how to do that. Is that why this book, all the patients you see, I just get this feeling that this is where this came from. You kept seeing that people weren't self-loving and they weren't, is that right? That you saw a lot of this in your practice or? Uh, uh, I, I realized it in myself. Um, you know, I had a lot of trauma growing up. I, I was a single mom at age 18. And, um, and then I had my own addictions, which evolved into from minor to severe. And uh, I, I got a lot of help and a lot of treatment, a lot of therapy, and I didn't really get well. And it wasn't until I relapsed and it was made clear to me through that inner voice of love that I talk about in the book that um, I didn't love myself. That was the problem. I was blaming God and it wasn't had nothing to do with that. It had to do with I didn't love myself. And I did not know what that meant. It was like for the first time, you know, I'd heard all this stuff about love, 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 love. love. I know, I know. I but what does that mean? <laughs> and so it actually means, you know, love is an action word and it actually means going back and doing the things for myself that I would do for a brand new baby and then a one-year-old and a two-year-old and a four-year-old and all of those things, you know, emotionally taking care of my mind, taking care of my body, taking care of my soul, learning how to communicate from love, yeah. addressing my fears, working through them, um, having friends, having playtime, having a career, you know, all of these kinds of things, but doing it from the place of abundance and love and caring and nurturing. Right. Yeah, and I love it. Do that. You know, it, to me, it was all about the outside, you know, like nails and hair and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. Education. I, yeah. In terms of really knowing how to really care about myself and say things like, you know, listen, that voice is, you are worth it. Find your voice to tell that person how you feel, but do it with love, not attack. Exactly. Do it from a place of love, from exactly. a place of let's heal this. Let's mm -hmm. work through this together. Um, those kinds of things. So, um, well, that, Donna, I can relate. That's <laughs> I just, book, yeah. You know? Yeah, it really is. Well, no, you have to go within. And I see that the more people I speak with. And that's why I'm so glad that you put this together. You're absolutely right. I went through similar stuff and, and realized I had to work on myself because it's not anybody else's fault. You got to figure it out yourself. You can't blame your parents forever. You can't blame anybody else. We all have to go within and find that light. And that's what's raising the consciousness now, you know, yes, and I planet. Even talk about going like being grateful for what. Yes. Happened. Yeah. Because 
I would right. never be the kind of therapist that I am had I not experienced all sides of all these equations that come into my office. No, you know, I think I understand it's yeah. that kind of pain and and the, and 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 when we have the mistakes that we have to forgive ourselves for, let alone what others have done, you know. So this is all part though of of you can't get that in school. There's no, no. school that can teach you the the life school, you know, that only comes from your own experiences and how we choose to perceive those things. I can live in bitterness all my life or I can live in graciousness and compassion all my life. Yeah. It's a well, choice. Yeah. And it was a blessing that you went through this because like you said, you wouldn't be the doctor you are today. And now you're able to help other people because until you go through it, you really don't know. You, you don't know what it feels like, you know, and that's wonderful that you're doing this. I really like this part of your book because I had similar uh, situation to you. And you say you have to teach people how to treat you. This really hit home with me. Would you address this a little bit? This is a section that you put in. Um, I'm not sure if that was under the control or the self-respect, but I believe it was under like- self no, no, Yeah, no, no, like self-respect. Self more than you respect yourself, yes. You know, again, do we want to be a victim and just let life roll over us? And then, you know, uh, even in uh, a lot of the spirituality things, you know, like rise above and take the yeah. high road and don't fight anyone or anything, you know, well, uh, you know, that's all very good. You know, we do want to evolve to the place that, that we can um, become detached observers uh, when someone's being disrespectful to us, we, when we, when we become detached observers, we are in that place of love instead of fear and, and we can stay neutral no matter what's going on. So that's good. But when you're involved with another human being and you're in a relationship, whether that's a love relationship, a parent and child relationship, a work relationship, I don't care what kind of relationship to lead, to have the absence of words that connect to your uh, emotional experiences, then you have no relationship at all. Mm -hmm. And there will be times where you will be disrespectful and you will be disrespected and you're not learning and growing if you're not doing the self-examination or helping someone else to see what they're doing. And right. I see this all the time in myself and my own marriage and my own relationships, but uh, particularly when I'm working with other people, you know, they feel so disrespected and to be able to understand this really isn't a direct attack on you. This person is stuck here in this behavior, but instead of sitting there and blaming that person for how they're making you feel, right. learn how to say, I love you very much. I don't like it when you tell me, uh, you know, that I'm an idiot. I don't like it when you use cuss words. I don't right. like it when you put me down. I want you to tell me how you feel. Did I hurt you? Did I embarrass you? Are you feeling angry? How did I trigger you? And then when you kind of have those kind of conversations, you really form deep attachments. You learn to trust the other person. Right. They create the space where you can talk. It doesn't always resolve everything. Sometimes it just takes a while to get there. You, it's not always instant that people could really come clean and open and honest, right. but it's the place that you begin and you build on that. And so then you have an authentic relationship because here's who I am. When you do this, it triggers that old wound in me. And I know this is my issue. I'm not blaming you, but I need to tell you that and vice versa. Right. You so know, you know where it's coming from. That's where those addictive relationships get really gnarly are those codependent things again, yeah. with work or relationships or whatever. We yeah. get really in those trauma bonds, they call them, because don't you see how I feel? <laughs> <laughs> no, that <laughs> makes a whole lot of sense. How I feel. This is how I feel. And it's not so much about you, but I need to share it with you. And right. I and this is why I feel this way. And that makes a whole lot of sense. No, you know, I just. I've noticed in my own self, since I've worked on my inner self, I've had a lot of different relationships go to the wayside and I have new relationships. Do you see that a lot in your practice as people begin to work on themselves and they change and they become more empowered and uh, those old relationships, do you see that fall to the wayside? Well, I don't like to look at it as falling to the wayside. Um, you know, the Course of Miracles says some relationships last forever, some for a short time, some for a lifetime. Uh, they're not all meant to be forever. Okay. You know, 
everything's designed for for our highest good and for our maximum amount of learning it's all about learning how to love mm -hmm. ourselves and others mm -hmm. and if there's somebody in our space that um is not growing along you know it's not that you're, you're leaving them behind it's just more like this you know you just yeah kind of like a you split because you go you've learned and so you've learned those lessons and now you move on to another yeah I like how you put that yeah you really have um you talk a lot about uh, a course in miracles uh in your book and that um is that something that you did when you were going through your stuff and it just really, and now you use it in your practice, can you share a little with well, us? I, I studied the course for a long time and I, I love it. Um, I think it's a very wonderful course, but I also feel that I misinterpreted it in many ways and oh. that it wasn't okay to be upset and it wasn't okay to be angry and uh, I had to go deeper in terms of it doesn't really tell you it's not okay to do that, but it what it does teach us is how to be the love that we want. So uh, I integrate the course with with psychology in terms of teaching people how, to, you know, not, not to attack, not to come from the fear, but to come from the love and examples I just gave a yeah. minute ago. Yeah. You know, maybe someone's maybe someone who's really um, tends to be on time is with someone who's always late. And let's say the person who's um, on time. They, the reason they're so on time is because their parent kept them waiting out in front of the schoolyard for hours. And they were scared and they had this unbearable anxiety as a child, you know, when is right. anyone ever going to come? And so now they're reliving that. Now they're not going to, you know, what happens, they'll blame, they'll start an argument right away. You're always late. Uh, da, 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 da. You know, yeah. rather than, I, I need to let you know when, when, <laughs> I, when you're, you know, half hour late or even sometimes five minutes late that childhood anxiety tries to brew up in me. I can manage that anxiety. It's for me to take care of it, but I just soon not have it. You know, I just want to let you know <laughs> that when you're late, it triggers that. And by, you know, the other thing the person could say, you know, when, and when you're mad at me, cause I'm late, it reminds me of my mother trying to be a helicopter <laughs> parent all the time, you know, and I feel yeah. all like I'm in jail, you know? So, so to be able to but have these with love and humor and care and growth, growth. That's what it's all about, to grow together. To come from a loving space, you know, it, it really does boil down to love. It really does. And that is something that we have to change in our society. I'm going to look at the bigger picture here. and I'm going to ask you your thoughts on the bigger picture. You know, I see so many people getting it and starting to hear these words like you're saying and talking about going within and and working on themselves what do you see do you see that as well with your books coming out and the people that you speak to do you see a difference well I think that <clears throat> excuse me I think that there are a lot of people that realize something's wrong and something's missing um, you know it's very fashionable nowadays to be agnostic or atheist it's like the cool thing and uh, there's a lot of people that that isn't working for, you know, just do what you want, when you want, how you want. And, you know, I, I'm a good person. That's enough. And uh, but there's this void and this emptiness inside that, uh, you know, when you switch from thing to thing to thing <laughs> and none of it works and you just feel worse and you get depressed and you're anxious. And and that's like such a huge problem right now of, of people on psycho, uh, psycho, psychiatric medication for anxiety. I know, depression. I know. You know? hundreds of millions of people uh, that we know of and then all the other people they're self-medicating with alcohol and, and drugs and and what have you so but eventually these people are recognizing you know something this cannot be it this just cannot be it mm -hmm. and so they begin searching you know the minute they realize that they're having their healing moment there was a great story I heard on the radio. It wasn't one of my patients, but this uh, this gentleman uh, couldn't get his pot during COVID. And he, <laughs> oh my he God. was raw. You know, he's got like uh, uh, freaking out, you know, oh my God, you know, I'm, I'm not numbed out all the time. Oh my God. And uh, and he was like pacing around and dialing the thing. And then all of a sudden he had this, you know, he heard this inner voice, which I talk about in the healing moment, you know, like, why do you think you're here? Why are you here? who are you? Why are you here? Mm -hmm. And it was like the light bulb went off. And it's like, oh my God, I'm certainly not here just to be pacing around like this, like a wild caged tiger waiting for my drugs. And he quit. He quit. 
And it was like a whole breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I experience that all the time with people. It's beautiful and wonderful when someone has just cracked open. It doesn't feel good when it's happening. <laughs> yeah. The whole facade comes tumbling off and you feel very naked and exposed. But it is the beginning of reconnecting to who you really are and that inner light and that inner love and that voice of love. Yes. Because that young man heard that voice of love and it, he was forever changed back to what he was born to be. Yeah. I love that you talk about this because I talk about connecting to the divine all the time on the show. And I'm glad that you said, unfortunately, it's not cool um, to be connected with, I say God, you can say source. A lot of people say divine. Although I did see on the Super Bowl this year, a couple commercials for Jesus. So that made me happy. But I, I, so I see a little bit of a shift, you know, but you know, it really does boil down to uh, connecting. And that no, fulfillment, no, no. that fulfillment, I let me just get this out and then I'll shut up. <laughs> that fulfillment that you have inside is the love that comes from the divine. And people have, we've lost it and, and I've got it back. And I see other people like yourself and more and more people getting it back, but that's the key. It really is. I think that there's a, uh, there's a polarity between um, religion and, and atheism. And uh, I think that there is a movement to, to get, to move people away from spirituality. I know. Uh, that's a whole different thing, but yeah. uh, people that, you know, are, are, are the cool ones who, you know, they're too smart to, to believe in God and things like that. Um, I don't have really have a problem working with those people because it's easier to work with someone who doesn't know than someone who thinks that there's only one answer and they do know it. And so uh, what, what I like to do when I'm working with people, because I, I believe that the, the, the God is a, the divine order, the divine intelligence, and that there's a part of that, you know, we have that microchip in us. Yeah, we have that spark. Order. We have that Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> but sometimes people have just been so turned off to religion that they don't want to hear. Anything. I agree with you, Donna. I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I don't know a lot of times I want to say, oh, I'm going to have a sermon. But then I stop myself and say, well, you can't preach and you can't say it's a sermon. You have to change it so people will listen to you because they don't want to be preached to. You know what I mean? You ha we have to change it so it's coming across differently. So I'm working on it all the time, trying to figure out how to take the verbiage that turn people off. You know what I mean? And change it all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I talk about that in the introduction of my book and, and what, I, what I believe and what people will almost always agree with. I haven't had anyone disagree with it yet. I'll, I'll ask them, do you ever feel like you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing? And they go, of course, <laughs> of course I do. And I'm like, well, wh what makes you feel like you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing? And they'll say, well, you know, it's like that little angel or the devil tapping on my shoulder, or they'll say, uh, you know, I knew I was a stupid thing to do, but I just did it anyhow. <laughs> or um, they'll, they'll give me examples of when, you know, they, they, they maybe were inspired, you know, you, you really ought to take advantage of that opportunity, like buy that house or make that investment or take that little risk. And, and they wish that, you know, it was very strong. They knew they should have done it, but they didn't do it. Right. So this is the conscious the conscience, the conscience. And this is that part of us, like we are born with it. Um, like I said, we have a new baby and she was walking around the other day. She had taken a, a, a bottle of um, uh, a leaf out of the garbage. And I, we were telling her, no, that's garbage. Oh, okay. Not to touch it. And she was walking around with that. She snuck in there, snuck in <laughs> and got the bottle and was walking around the corner going, no, 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 no. So oh those, my two God. Parts, those two parts are there. She, like I said, we're born with it. That <laughs> inner knowing, that inner knowing of right from wrong. And when we mm. listen to that voice that says, this might really be a good idea, or this is a bad idea, but you know, we have the free will to listen to it. Mm -hmm. But that's the voice that I feel is the divine. That right. is our connection to our higher power, to our God of our understanding, whatever you want to Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it. And when people begin to listen to that, 
It's like you get in your car and you have to go across country and you're going to depend on your navigation system. If you're going to ignore that and say, oh, I know how to get there. You just head west or head east or head. You're going to be going all over the place <laughs> and right. you're going to be frustrated and you're going to get lost a lot. When we listen to that internal navigation system, that God-given voice that mm -hmm. says, try this, or maybe you don't want to do that. It's not that loud voice. It's more the soft inner guidance. It is, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Then we, we save ourselves a lot of grief and we find our way and we are happy. And you're correct. Every time we don't listen to that voice, we're kicking ourselves and we all have it. We all have the intuition. I always tell people I'm a intuitive and I always say, you don't need to call me. You just need to connect with the divine and you'll get your answers. I, yeah. You don't need to call me to tell you. <laughs> so, Absolutely. you and know, we listen to that voice of fear, which is the other voice, you know, it keeps us driving all over the continent looking for something we could have gotten to in, you know, a day or two. Right. And there's so much fear. And, and I'm just really glad you put this together because there are a lot of people out there who don't know about this stuff and they're just starting to get a little taste of it. And you go through a lot of fantastic information. Um, what would you like to leave us with today? I'm so glad you came on. Oh, thank you so much for having me. You know, the main important thing, and I think as I started, you know, we all have a reason that we're here beyond just existing and uh, what we think we're here for. And I just want all your listeners to know that they are loved and that they have a mission and they have a purpose. And that I hope that they will listen to those healing moments. You know, it's that when that light bulb goes off, it's when in that moment of, oh, I didn't realize I didn't know that. Or that moment of, you know, there's things been gnawing at me for a long time that I should do. And I just haven't felt confident enough to do it. Or uh, to be able to take some risks that are healthy and good risks and to get out of the box. We all live in this box, you know, get out, I know, lift I up know. the lid, I let know. the sun shine in. So <laughs> that's really what I would say is really take the chance of believing in yourself. That's beautiful. You guys, the book is called The Healing Moment. It's by Dr. Donna Marks. Donna, if people want to get in touch with you, your website is? www.drdonnamarks.com. Okay, fantastic. Thanks Love for coming on. From them too. Love to hear from them. I got, when I was on Coast to Coast the other night, wonderful, wonderful emails and responses. It was great. I love interacting with the audience. I love it. Yeah, you guys, she was on Coast to Coast the other night and um, she's she's becoming a big celeb and we're really excited that she came to share her information with us because it's really important. And thank you. Thanks for writing. And I'm so excited that you invited me on your show. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, you guys, I want to get out of here for today. I hope you guys have a fabulous weekend and God bless.